All right, so welcome everyone. Um, this is the third webinar of the 2016 IGNIS series, so thanks for joining us. If you haven't already done so, please feel free to check your audio. If you are experiencing any audio trouble or you don't have a functioning headset today, I'm putting the call-in number into the chat. Feel free to call in um, on the phone if you'd prefer, so there's that alternate way to participate there. All right, so I'm thrilled to have you all join us today. Ignis is the Latin word for spark or ignite, and that's exactly what we're hoping to do today, to ignite your curiosity and to spark your intellect. This series is brought to you by the SBCTC Office of eLearning and Open Education. My name is Alyssa Sells, and I'll be your host today. Our presenter today is John Mitchell from Clark College, and he's going to lead us in an exploration of mindfulness. And um, let me just get my slides up here so we'll go on to the next one here so you can see John. There he is. You'll also see him. Um, he's going to be using his camera today, so you'll get to see him while he's talking as well. And this is part one of a two-part series on mindfulness that we're running this month. So join us again next week for part two, uh, Bridget. Agpo Ryder from Tacoma Community College will um, be joining us next Thursday to um, continue our exploration of mindfulness. So a big thank you to John for sharing his knowledge and expertise with us this afternoon. I would encourage you, um, so that you truly get the most out of today's webinar, to eliminate as many distractions from your environment as possible. So please turn off your cell phone and close your email and um, really give John your attention as he guides us through some short mindfulness practice um, opportunities. Okay, let me talk to you about captioning for just one second. All of our web uh, webinars will be captioned this season, and I'd like to thank a la carte for their real-time captioning services. Uh, Bonnie's here today doing those for us, so thank you, Bonnie. To activate the captions, if you'd like to use those, click on the CC button. And Sorry, I keep getting messages that there's a teleconference failing, so um, I'll have to check that in just a minute. But to activate those captions, click on the CC button in the top right corner of the audio video panel, or um, you can use um, Control F8 to open them or, and Control W to close the captioning window. And then you can also find a list of Collaborate keyboard shortcuts if you need to use those or if you like to use those. Those are located in the Help menu. Let me just change our slide here. Okay, there's our help menu, and I'm going to go ahead and give you some links in the chat real quick. Uh, this first link is to the keyboard shortcut, and um, the next one that I'm going to give you right now, um, this one goes to the accessibility guide for participants for using Collaborate. Just want to make sure that you guys have all the resources you need before we get going. So um, as you know, we do record these webinars, and you can access the recording link on the ATL blog. And if you're not familiar with the ATL blog, I'm going to give you that link here in the chat as well. And um, you can find that through the IGNIS um, drop-down menu, so it's pretty easy to find. There you can also select to find um, recordings and resources or accessing the full schedule. So um, later after the webinar and I get the recording posted, you can go there and find all of John's resources and everything you need to know uh, about what happened during the webinar. So traditionally we started our IGNIS webinars by running through a few of the Collaborate tools. And we're going to do that now, and then I'll turn it over to John. But I'm going to move through them pretty quick today because um, we're only going to use, I think, mostly the chat today. So we're not going to linger too long on any of the tools. Just as a refresher, this is the meeting interface. We've got several components. Upper left is the audio video panel. That's where you see my picture now, and that's where you'll see John when he begins speaking. That middle section is the participant panel, and that's where you can scroll up and down and see who else is in the webinar with you. And the lower left is the chat box, and that's where we'd like to type it, have you type in your question 
questions and comments as we go through. Um, John would prefer that you hold your questions and comments or type them into the chat as he goes, and then we will revisit those during the Q&A portion. Uh, it's just um, the nature of the webinar today. He'd like, like us to stay focused on um, our practices and, and what we're doing during the webinar. So we will definitely come back to questions at the end. Uh, these are your participant tools. There are emoticons. You can raise your hand. Later, if you do have a question, feel free to raise your hand and we will call on you in order. I'm going to just click my hand right now so you can see. It puts me in the queue with a little hand by my name so that I know that I'm the next one to, um, to get called on. There's also a polling tool, and um, those are the under the check marks. But I don't think we're going to use those today, but they are there just in case we, we decide we want to later. And your talk button is on when you see the little blue microphone to the right of your name. So if you do want to ask a question verbally, um, you will need to turn your talk button on to speak, and you'll need to turn that off when you're done. So that's pretty easy. And um, that's it for me. I actually finished up about 50 seconds early. So um, that's rare and unusual. So I'm going to turn it over to John now and let him go ahead and share his screen and let him get going. John, take it away. OK. Thanks, Alyssa. Yeah. Hi, everyone. And uh, I hope you can uh, see my slides here. Yeah, and uh, great. it's great to be here. So it's good to be here with everyone. And I'm thrilled to be doing this this afternoon. Um, we're going to explore some basic ideas about mindfulness. We're going to do it experientially. We're going to uh, do some active practices, some very simple practices, but they'll really kind of get to the heart of what mindfulness is all about. And uh, then I'm, I'm looking forward to you know, a question and answer session at the end and hear, hearing what you think. So just to firstly give you some background uh, of how I became interested in mindfulness and, and, and how I came to this point. I uh, took a course in mindfulness for stress reduction about six years ago. And uh, I think the reason why I took it was, is, is right there in the title. I, I felt I was always running around in you know my job as a mathematics lecturer constantly you know, stressing, thinking about the next thing. I wanted something to that would help me better balance my work and, and my life. And I feel that mindfulness has had a, such a profound effect on how I approach things that since, since then I've deepened my mindfulness practice. I've uh, researched how mindfulness can be part of college life as well as personal life. And I joined the Koru teacher training program, which teaches uh, academics to uh, teach a mindfulness basic skills course. And I'll have more to say about that a little later. So I'm in the Koru teacher training program at the moment. And uh, they're wonderful people. I should mention that I, I'm not here in any official capacity or not representing the organization of Koru, which is uh, based at Duke University. But I highly recommend the program. And I've put a link in my resources uh, so you can follow up if you're interested. So that's how I, I got into mindfulness. I um, started with just a basic course. And, and since then, I've, I've really thought about, well, where can mindfulness uh, be practiced? And, and, and we're going to discover that the answer is really everywhere. Uh, every moment is an opportunity for mindfulness practice. So what we're going to look at today, we're first going to uh, develop an experiential understanding of what mindfulness is all about. We're going to then look at how we might apply it in our daily lives. And then we're going to broaden the lens and look at how it can sustain and enhance college life. So I'm hoping to that we can uh, by the end of this, this talk, we, we have some, not just an understanding of how mindfulness can be applied personally, but how it can be applied in community with others and in connection with others. So I should start by uh, clarifying a few things about mindfulness, because the word can be used in a variety of contexts. And I'll be giving an experiential definition and, a, and an approach to this shortly. But, but firstly, 
to mention that we're going to be talking about it as a quality of engagement with the present moment. That's one sense people use the word mindfulness. More broadly, it's used often as a practice or set of practices to cultivate this quality of engagement. It can also be used to uh, refer to a habit or trait. We can talk about a mindful individual, uh, somebody who's developed habits of mindfulness or, car or displays mindfulness as an aspect of their character. But it's also a field of study. So, and I'll have more to say about this at the end of the lecture, the, the research that's going on in mindfulness and uh, the many areas that mindfulness is contributing to. So it can be used in all these senses. But to get to these other senses, we really have to uh, look at directly at this idea of the quality of engagement with the present moment. So I'm going to start with a, a, a verbal definition of this. But uh, really, we're going to need to experience it to, to see uh, what this means. So a simple definition by a researcher called Christopher Germer is awareness of the present moment with acceptance. Now, this is a short definition, but it really captures uh, the core ideas that we're going to be dealing with over the, over the coming uh, minutes. We're going to be looking in more detail at awareness. We're also going to look at what it means to be present. And finally, we're going to look at, at what we mean by acceptance. So let's start with awareness. And we're going to do a short experiential practice here. And I just invite you to be playful with this. You can participate uh, as much or as little as you wish. I'm just going to give some suggestions and invitations and encourage you to see what your experience is. So just simply notice how you're seated right now in your chair. And you may leave your eyes open or close them. It may help to close them, but it's, it's your choice. And uh, I'm going to invite you just to wiggle your toes. You may have footwear on, just wiggle as best you can. Just bring your awareness to your toes. Notice how a moment ago your awareness was not on your toes, and now it is. Just wiggle your toes and notice the shift. Now, stop wiggling your toes and just Keep your awareness on your toes and your feet. Just notice what's here right now. The sensations of your feet. Here we're focusing our awareness like a spotlight on our feet. And now, just simply shift your awareness to your hands. Notice a moment ago you were aware of your toes and your feet, and now your awareness is on your hands. We can shift this spotlight around from one part of the body to another. We can also shift it to sound. So now just bring your awareness to the sounds. My voice but also the sounds in the room you're in, the feeling of the air on your skin. Now we're bringing awareness to our skin. And now bring awareness to your whole body as it sits here. So we can expand our awareness like a floodlight. We can focus it on something very small, or we can focus it on an expansive area. So when we look at awareness, and just coming back to this idea, we notice that we can 
be aware of lots of things. There's a lot going on in each moment. We've got our five senses. And in each of these senses, we can pay attention to a particular thing or a lot. We can focus in on one aspect of our experience, or we, well, we can do what is called open monitoring. We can open our experience to encompass a wide range of things. We can also bring our awareness, of course, to thoughts and feelings. So here's our full polish, as it were, of experience. In every moment, all of these things are going on, and our awareness can be directed to any particular one, or indeed several. It can be focused on one thing, or many. So this is, this is what we mean by awareness, and perhaps that helps understand the first part of mindfulness, the mind in mindfulness. It, mindfulness can encompass thought, but it's, it's not just about thought. It's really about the, the awareness of our experience. So it can be thoughts, feelings, and, and all the senses. And, but awarefulness is a bit of a mouthful. So we say mindfulness really uh, when we refer to being aware of our experience. So that's the first part of uh, mindfulness, of the awareness part. Now the second aspect then is uh, the present moment. And to get into this, I want you to think about something. And this might be something to uh, reflect on briefly. And if you wish, you may choose to put a percentage in in, in the chat box. It's the simple reflection is this. What proportion of your time, of time, is, is your awareness on the present moment? as opposed to, say, thinking about the future or the past. So just reflect on this for a moment. Perhaps half the time. Perhaps 90% of the time. Well. There have been studies done of this, and I've uh, put a, a link to one of the studies in the uh, additional resources, but it, it turns out that uh, several years ago, some researchers uh, constructed an app and, uh, and were able to survey people from moment to moment on where their attention was. And on average, their minds wandered 47% of the time. and rarely more than 30% of the time. This surprised me. <laughs> I, I'm interested in hearing in the question and answers uh, how you feel about this, how it compares to your own experience. But the basic finding is our minds wander a lot. Now, as a mathematician, I couldn't resist a graph. So here's a little, little pictorial guide. So present moment. The here and now, what's going on, and being fully engaged in the here and now. Well, we often find that we're doing something either rehearsing for the future. I've just put some sample words up here for both the future and past. But you might have, have better words that you would substitute for your own experience. So we often find that our minds are elsewhere, and specifically our thoughts are elsewhere. Because it's often the case that our thoughts effectively hijack our present moment experience. And we find ourselves thinking about something else. Or narrating the present moment experience in some way. And that's, that's what I want to talk about when it comes to acceptance, which is the next part of our definition. So when we talk about acceptance, we're talking about the quality of engagement with the present moment. And uh, some, some ways this may be the fully accepting words like willingness and curiosity, openness to our experience. Now, these are simple things to say, but the cultivation of them is a lifetime of, of practice. Um, we find ourselves often narrating or judging the present moment experience. 
finding ourselves trying to move from this moment to another moment, wishing the moment were different. So acceptance is not about passive resignation. It's about embracing the fullness of, of the moment, including its difficulties, as part of working most skillfully with that moment. So this is our definition then, in, in, a, in a nutshell. We're looking at being fully present and accepting what is going on in this present moment, working skillfully with this present moment. Now, I hope it's clear how life is just a series of present moments. So the moments that we're not present for are lost to us. And the discipline of mindfulness says that it asserts that this is a skill that can be cultivated. And in fact, being present is a skill that we all have innately, but that our busy lives can tend to pull us away from, from this skill. And so mindfulness as a discipline and a practice is acting as a counterbalance to the busy, distracting, multitasking world we live in and being able to stay with our own experience. So let's talk about how we might cultivate mindfulness. So we're going to do a short practice together. And I'll guide and I've put up a restful picture of the San Juans that you're, I welcome you to, to look at during this practice or close your eyes. And we're simply going to do a short meditation together, focusing on our breath. And this is one way of cultivating mindfulness. So I invite you to either keep your eyes open or close them. And take a dignified posture in your seat however that speaks to you. Just notice your body in your seat. Notice how you're feeling right now. Bring a smile to your face. And gently bring your awareness to your breath as it is right now. Just notice how you're breathing. Without changing anything, just notice the breath as it comes in and as it goes out. You may find you notice your breath in a particular location. And just bring your awareness to that. You may notice your breath in your belly, or your throat, or at the tip of your nostrils, or some other location. And just use that gently as a point of awareness and contact as you breathe in and as you breathe out. Just being curious about this present moment with your breath. Noticing any thoughts that arise. And just letting them float by as if they were leaves on a river. Gently, just staying with your breath. And if your mind wanders, coming back to your breath.
And now gently expanding your awareness to your body. And the sounds in the room, feeling back into your location. And when you're ready, opening your eyes if they were closed. And just taking a moment to notice your present experience right now. Any shift in your experience, any change in your body sensation in this brief meditation. So let's uh, reflect on this practice and look at some other practices that we might use to develop mindfulness. So we've just explored a meditation, just a very brief breathing meditation. There's many other types of meditation because any sense can be an object or focus of our own awareness. We can meditate and bring our awareness to sounds, for example. We can also increase the duration of our practice, and build resilience and focus that way. And some do go on extensive meditation retreats, often involving silence for several days. But we don't have to just meditate to be mindful. We can also look at other activities and make them mindful activities if, if we choose to pay attention to that experience. And I'll let you reflect on, on this as I just show some examples on what areas of your life you may already be practicing mindfulness in. We can also bring mindfulness to other activities such as work and errands by simply noticing our experience and returning to it. Now I say simply, it's a simple but not easy practice and there, we all have areas of our lives where we find it difficult to be mindful. So bringing mindfulness to those activities and cultivating a stability of presence in them can be a powerful tool to be more present for, for the rest of our lives, for every moment of our lives. A third aspect of mindfulness practice is what I call noticing mind, mindless hotspots. And I'll bring in some technology areas here, areas that I particularly find difficult to be mindful in. And I feel that many people find the technical devices we're surrounded with extremely difficult to be mindful in usage of. And so one area I encourage you to reflect on is mindfulness and technology. And in fact, let's take a moment now for you to reflect on these aspects of mindfulness practice. And the question I'll ask you is, how can we use technology mindfully? Do you, do you have a skill you use that you'd like to share with others? Do you have a question that you wish to share with others? So just take a moment to reflect on this and we'll, we'll explore this when we chat, how we use technology mindfully. It's still a work in progress for me, I must admit. We live in an age of almost infinite distraction. We, we have the most distracting devices ever developed, and now they're portable. I think we're living in a time of unique challenges where mindfulness is needed more than ever. So in summary, mindfulness is mind training for our minds in the same way we have physical training and healthy eating for our bodies. We've talked here about 
ways of disciplining our awareness so that we stay present. We also talked about looking mindfully at what information we consume in the same way we would look at mindfully eating healthy, healthy food, perhaps limiting our consumption of sugar. In the same way, perhaps, there's areas of technology that are like the, the mental uh, analogs of sugar. And they're, they're areas we particularly need to be, be careful of. So I hope by now you see how transforming our present moment experience can, can hit many, many aspects of our lives. And I'll, I'll just flash up a few areas here where mindfulness has, has been a core component of programs on areas like stress reduction, which I mentioned at the start of the talk, on um, cultivating empathy and connection, for example. And I have posted a link that I, I, I encourage you to, to watch at some, some time convenient to you on. Uh, it's called Just Breathe. And it's a bunch of children uh, discussing mindfulness. And it, I find it stunning uh, to, to listen to how they have learned to identify and work skillfully with their emotions and thoughts. And they understand how to, to simply, that their thoughts are just thoughts and that they are able to work with, with really very mature awareness. And so my own feeling is that in the long term, we will find mindfulness at, in early childhood development. And in fact, in, in the later slide, I'll talk about that. So let's talk about then the evidence that mindfulness is helping people. So I've talked about my own experiential evidence and, and, and the millions of people that have, have benefited from mindfulness programs and practices. But there is also a lot of formal research. Uh, the links I've posted uh, will get you started looking at some of those areas. Um, I should mention briefly that there's also uh, a more formal effort to assess and capture what mindfulness is. And there's now mindfulness assessment scales that are used by researchers to quantify, to some extent, uh, one's capacity to be mindful. And they'll look at areas like uh, one's ability to uh, be aware of one's feelings, one's ability to be open to uh, one's current experience, and, and so on. A growing area of research is the neurobiological evidence. So we don't just have people saying that mindfulness is helping them and showing it in their daily lives, but when they do brain scans, they find that there is evidence that mindfulness practices change brain structure. They thicken the cortex in, in some cases. They, they cause changes that, that are manifested in the way we're, we're, uh, we're behaving in our daily lives. So what our minds rest on shapes them. And mindfulness, we, we are more skillful in what we, ch we allow our mind, minds to rest on. So some reflections on how this can impact college life. And I, I guess I would, would start with the, the, the question to you all. Do you feel our students suffer from an excess of mindfulness? Is there too much mindfulness? Are they too undistracted? I don't believe so. I think there's a lot that we can do to help our students be more mindful. I also encourage you to reflect on how mindfulness can help us better serve students. How can, how can we be better in our, in our roles in our college? How can we work our jobs more skillfully? And there's many people thinking about this at the moment. In the same way sustainability has revolutionized academia, I believe mindfulness is and will revolutionize academia. As people, just as people started paying more attention to how we were uh, consuming and being in the world around us, now we're seeing people increasingly turn our attention to 
how we be how we pay attention to the world around us and whether this is healthy for our minds. So many educators have been thinking about this over the last 20 years. And I'm just going to flash up some organizations that are working with this. Uh, the first two are at the high school and grade school level. Uh, they're confusingly rather similarly named. Uh, Mindful Schools is primarily based in the US, but also is worldwide. And Mindfulness in Schools is is more worldwide, but perhaps with its primary base in Britain and the rest of Europe. So these are high school and grade school uh, mindful programs. And then at the higher level, I've mentioned KORU, the teacher training program I'm part of. And there's also for academics looking to incorporate mindfulness into education. Uh, there is the Association of Contemplative Mind in Higher Education. It's a professional body for educators interested in mindfulness and reflection in general. I posted links to several of these in, in, the, in the resources. So some suggestions. So of course, uh, foundational to mindfulness is to have one's own practice. And I posted a, a worksheet that will look at each of those areas I talked about. Uh, direct practices of mindfulness, then practicing on daily activities, and looking at mindless hotspots. And just, it includes some, some space for you to put in your own thoughts and customize your own practice. It can be hard to practice without a community or course, so some structure can be really helpful. Two courses I recommend are MBSO, Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction, and Koru itself. MBSR is an eight-week mindfulness skills course. CORE is a shorter mindfulness skills course. It's four weeks, and it's, it's targeted uh, primarily at folks either working or studying at, in higher-level institutions. Join a community to practice with, to, to help cultivate those mindful habits, and create a community. I feel that the community we're creating here at Clark is really starting to take root, and I'm seeing the benefits of that. I'd love to hear from other communities and other, other colleges. The final suggestion I have, of course, is to tune in next week for part two, when Brigitte Agpoa-Ryder will take up the cause of mindfulness by discussing how mindfulness can impact professional development. So, with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and focus and mindfulness, and I'll turn it back over to Alyssa and see what questions we have. Thank you, John. That was great. Just like your practice session earlier in the week, I thoroughly enjoyed that. Um, we did have some folks type some things into the chat as we were going. I was one of them, but several other people um, put in some questions and comments. So let me just scroll down to that area. Um, I also put in some links to your documents and um, some of the studies and things that you mentioned so um, people could access um, quickly and easily access those if they wanted to take a quick look. Um, all right. Let's see. Sorry, i got to scroll down here. OK, so on the first question that you asked us um, about how much of our attention is engaged in the present, we have a whole variety of answers. We have um, 5 to 10 percent. I said about 60 percent. Um, Don said 1 percent. Uh, Janella said a very small percentage. Liz said maybe less than 5. And then um, John, uh, let me know when you're driving, okay? <laughs> Nicola said not <laughs> enough, and <laughs> Jessica says she finds that she's often on <laughs> autopilot. So I'll let you run with um, your response to some of the comments that folks typed in. Sure, that's that's wonderful. Let, let me have a look. Uh, so that's wonderful that there's such a variety of responses. Um, One percent on yes. Um, uh, it feels like that sometimes for me as well. It's like you, you go through a day and you wonder where was I? Um, so we we all we all have we all vary in this. And I think we all vary from day to day. Um, and I guess for me, 
part of the idea of mindfulness practices is just to um, incre increase our batting average, as it were, and uh, perhaps open up to areas where we traditionally would, uh, would skate through it. Now, I'm looking at some questions. Let me just take a few that I see. Um, one, one question is, are there any books you would recommend? Jessica, thanks. Um, uh, yes, in fact, Alyssa, would it be okay if I sent a second document or a third document? Of course, later, I, think, I can post? get those posted for you as soon as you get them okay. to me. I actually, Jessica, I have a book list, um, and uh, um, I can post it later. Um, just off the top of my head, one I really like, simply because it also has a structured course in it, is called Mindfulness by Mark Williams and Danny Penman. And it's a paperback, it's about $10. Um, and uh, um, it's, a, it's a good book for a self-study because it has a seven-week mindfulness course. Each chapter gives you a set of practices to do. And it, so I really, I really like that, that it's a very, uh, it, it's, it's a very directed and experiential approach to mindfulness. But I have a list of other books as well that are that are great too, and I'll I'll, I'll post it along to Alyssa. Great, thank you. Let's see what else. Oh, so I see a question here on how much does Koru cost? You know, you'd have to check with them on that. It's been a while since I took the program and I was able to get some, you know, uh, work through some some uh, funding issues. So I think it, it, I wouldn't be comfortable answering that. But uh, yeah, I'd get in touch with them and see what the current cost of the program is. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, I'll say this, um, it's, it's cheaper than MBSR. <laughs> Mindfulness based, to become a mindfulness-based stress reduction teacher is, is very expensive. I, I believe, you know, it, we'd be talking in the five to ten thousand dollar range. I believe. Yes, um, I think uh, that's an interesting idea. Um, I'm just looking through the chat. So, on the mindful use of technology, um, and this is is this one of your ideas? So. Focus students by using the yes, technology that normally distracts them. That's a really, that's a fascinating idea, yes. Um, so it's like a bait and switch where you go, okay, you want to use your cell phone? Yeah. Let's use your cell phone. Yes. Well, if they're going to use them um, anyways. That's, that's a good idea. Yeah. Yes. Harness the, dis harness the distractions. In, indeed, Liz, yes. Uh, embrace and harness the distractions. So there's some distractions that we can, by changing the situation, we can remove. Other times we just have to harness them and say, this is here. So I, I, I agree totally. Yes. Uh, Dawn, always worrying about what is next. Work thing, mom thing. You have my, my sympathy and compassion for that. It's, it's, uh, I'm... It's it's uh, it is. There's always so much on our plates, so much to do, um, and it's 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 part of this this worrying about what is next is is almost what our minds are designed to do. Is they're they're threat detectors and they're very very good at it. So they're constantly looking out for the next thing that we need to focus on. I feel that what mindfulness says is that the the issue is when we're constantly doing this, it's exhausting that if we're constantly scanning, as it were, for, for the next, next problem, it can be exhausting. So mindfulness practices can help us relax uh, because it, we can turn off the, the doer for a while and just take some time for ourselves and just be in the moment. So it can be a little reset on that constant doing. But I, I will say it can be hard to find the time to do practices. So we have to be also be compassionate to that and work within our own own limits. I found that there was times where you know I couldn't just do a, a long meditation, and even a minute a minute for breathing helps so much. So they don't they don't have to be long practices to have a beneficial mm, that's effect. That's good to know. Um, John Nicola has um, oh. 
posted a couple of really great questions in here. I'd like to read one to you. I don't know if you've come to it net, net yet. Um, she says, another thought or question that she's sure. pondering, when did we, in quotations, the larger we, um, lose the ability um, to the point that we are needing, that it's needing to be rediscovered? Did we ever really have these skills? Is there a general point when society became less mindful um, that we can identify? Do you have any thoughts on that? You know, I I think these are, yeah, I, I think these are, like, really, this is kind of, these are larger points about a society that's in such ran, rapid transition that its identity is changing. I, I feel that um, what I keep coming back to is, is all, the only experience we can, we can be custodians of is our own. Um, I, I assume, I have to assume that in days of, of more uh, quieter times that people were more mindful. I, it, 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 I, I notice, for example, that when, when I'm in the outdoors, there's a kind of an automaticity to dropping into the present moment that, do, that feels more easily accessible than when, say, I'm driving in traffic. And so I feel there was probably times, my own view is there was probably times where it was easier to be mindful. Um, there was just less going on. Um, I, I think that, uh, I think my own view is that we are losing this ability. <laughs> that uh, the devices we have in our lives right now are designed to distract us as much as possible. That's their purpose. That's how they make money. <laughs> and so I feel that now is the time that it, these, these, these practices are needed. Um, and, and Nicola, I see another question of yours about uh, when did this all start to emerge. Um, I'd say in, it's been studied in, in, in meditation has been a part of, of, of many uh, spiritual traditions. And most, in fact, I'd say most spiritual traditions have some kind of meditation as part of them. Um, uh, mindfulness as a, I'd say a secular discipline really started emerging in, in the West over the last 30 years. And uh, the person considered the founder is, and one of his books is one I recommend, is a, a guy called John Kabat-Zinn, who developed the mindfulness-based uh, stress reduction course. And originally, he, he, he's a medical doctor, and he developed it at a, a, a clinic for patients who are suffering from chronic pain. And then he expanded the program to deal with stress reduction. But he really took uh, meditation practices, particularly from Buddhist traditions, uh, and basically looked at the practice itself without any spiritual um, extras, as it were, and looked at how it could help people uh, in their day-to-day -day lives. And really, that, I think, was, was, was one of the, the primary um, instigators of, of mindfulness in, in the West. Um, but I should say, like, you know, it's, it's really mindful. The one wonderful thing to me about mindfulness is that it really doesn't, it, it's not contingent on any beliefs. It's, it, these, these are practices that anyone can practice uh, from any tradition. But yeah, I'd say t 30 years is, is a, maybe, maybe going on 40 now is when uh, these courses first started to be developed. Oh, uh, Jessica, you're asking, uh, being constantly present could be hard and tiring. That's a fascinating question. Um, I guess we're not talking about focused. Uh, 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 that, um, being constantly focused would be extremely hard and tiring, I, I, I feel. But uh, again, our awareness can expand to fit any part of our experience. To be present would include if, if we're, we're in difficulty or if we're tired. So part of our experience, if we're tired, is to really honor that we're tired and, and work with that tiredness, to notice that we're tired, to notice that what, or to notice what we're doing is hard. So I'd say awareness, being present itself isn't hard or, or tiring, it's really just being present. But being focused could be. 
but that there's an, a lot that being focused is a little bit different because it's pulling one's attention to one aspect, one exclusive aspect of one's experience. The awareness would allow us to, to notice what's happening in our bodies while we're doing that and notice, hey, I'm getting tired here. I need to take care of myself. I need to back off a little bit. Yes, uh, yeah, I see. I see. Great, you're seeing the distinction there. And of course, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a feeling as well as a thinking. There's, there's like a, there's, we're, we're looking at our whole felt sense when we we're looking at awareness as well as what we're thinking. Yeah, um, that, that's why we, I use the word awareness as opposed to the word attention. Attention, uh, you know, I, I feel that if whatever word speaks most to you in terms of your own experience works fine, but I felt attention had a little bit of a directed cognitive component. You could be having your attention on grading, but then your awareness notices that there's a, a, a great bird song that's going on while you're grading. Um, so that your focus, your attention is what you consciously did. And then your awareness is looking out for you as it were. So it can be consciously directed or unconsciously. It can just move to something that's, that's of relevance to us. Oh, Jessica has a question. Can you also send out information on the resources of Clark? Of course, yes. Um, just to mention briefly to everyone who's um, uh, for folks who aren't at Clark as well. So a few things that are going on at Clark here. Um, we do now have a student mindfulness club, um, which has just got it, gotten going a, about six weeks ago. We've got a few students interested in that, and we're looking forward to growing it. I'm the faculty advisor of the club, along with uh, John Governale, who's in, in psychology. Um, and we've got a bunch of people who are interested in mindfulness. Um, my hope and vision is that we'll have a uh, some structure for the broader um, academic and student community over the coming um, months and years. But that's all in progress. I'm trying to be take it one moment at a time, not do too much too quickly. But yes, I'll send you send you uh, what we got. So, uh, Alyssa, have I? Uh, any questions you, you saw that um, I, I think might you've missed? gotten to most of them. Um, there was one other one in here, and I'm not sure if I remember if you addressed this one or not. It was um, another one from Nicola. Yes, and, and as you look for that, Janella, thanks for that. I, I noticed uh, a few suggestions earlier. Um, Yes, another area of uh, that mindfulness can be a, a core component of is healing from childhood issues. Yes, mindfulness is often used as a component for, for dealing with trauma. Um, and Jessica, you followed up on that. Yes, you, your class, yes, uh, focus breathing, again, is, 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 a, is a technique uh, for helping kids cope, recover from trauma. So, so we help them become mindful of what's going on in their bodies as part of healing from trauma. Oh, um, yeah, Jessica, uh, last question. Is there a specific type of yogi I find helpful? Um, I, I personally, I'm kind of a little bit of a, a you know, I, I, my yoga practice recently has been very sporadic. Uh, uh, so I, I wouldn't be great at answering that. But I feel that, uh, for me, it has helped to slow the practice down. I think that that's one part of yoga that, it, for me, has helped be a bit more mindful is to be really slow the postures down. And uh, so I find that the, the more, more um, uh, relaxed pace, for me, seems to help. But, but beyond that, I think it really it would, each person would have to explore and see if they can, how that practice works for them. So, Alyssa, you were saying yes, um, she did. Um, had another it was early on, and um, she says, "Is this something we should try and quantify? Isn't this more meta than that? Not a criticism, just a thought, really. Um, although I'm not sure exactly what you were talking about 
at the time that she typed this, so um, maybe she could clarify for you. Okay. Sure. I'm yes, a little further up that. here. Um, I had um, copied and pasted her question just so I didn't lose it. So there, um, I, the one that I just put in the chat is exactly what I just read to you. So, but I don't know if that helps you with the context oh. of what that you were looking for. Yeah. Yes, I see it. Is this something we should try and quantify? You know, um, Nicola. Yeah, that's I. You know, I have to say I'm a little bit. I am a little concerned about um, uh, too. So there are, I feel that the core and the heart of mindfulness is, is helping people. And I feel, I, I, I share that, that concern that while I'm glad that people are researching uh, mindfulness and building a, you know, like a case for its usage, but I feel that overly, becoming overly technical and quantifying about it is kind of, kind of as a practice, would be missing the point. Um, so yeah, and and uh, another concern I have is that, uh, say, the, the corporatization of mindfulness outside academia. Um, I feel that there there are um, uh, places that are like mindfulness. I would hate to see mindfulness become solely a tool to be more productive at one's job, without a broader focus on cultivating. Uh, compassion, connection, being cultivating wisdom around one's role in life, and I feel that uh, you know that's that's one reason I've I've seeked out communities myself that are are, are look at the broader picture of, of of you know doing these practices, and then how can we use mindfulness to to be more present in our own lives, more connected to those we love. More fulfilled in our in our in our our, our work, and uh, I would I feel that just simply um, focusing on the quantification of it, yeah, that's that is something I I I don't feel is 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 where my own focus is. So yes, I agree. Yeah, um, uh, yeah, it can become. As, as, as several of you said, I see Jessica's followed up on that. It, 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 one can become very. Um, I, I, my own preference for like for practice is not to become too regimented about it in terms of you must do this this many times per day, and, and it's also easy to get into comparisons and say, oh well, if somebody's meditating twice as often as I am, they must be twice as mindful. I keep coming back to the fact that these are innate skills that we all have, and and you know. Uh, you, as children, like I mentioned earlier, uh, like these are these are capabilities that I think many children manifest, um, and so you know we 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 approach them in that that spirit of of just of curiosity and humility, and uh, uh, we we try not to uh, become too. Uh, rigid and regimented about it, and, and goal-oriented. Somewhat ironically, one can become very goal-oriented about mindfulness, and the, 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 it's ironic that the mindfulness is about cultivating present moment experience, and once we start focusing excessively on goals, we can lose sight of that. <laughs> Jessica's posted, I am 25% more mindful than you all. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Twenty, yeah, whatever that would mean. Twenty-five percent more mindful. <laughs> well, yeah, Jessica wins. Indeed. John, do you mind if I share your email address with the audience, with participants? All right. Absolutely. Yes, it's simply jmitchellclark.edu, but feel free yeah, to share great. it. Just in version. case anyone has a follow-up questions for you. So um, I think we're about ready to wrap up. We're just on our 3 o'clock time, so I'll close this out real quick. Please do join us for part two next Thursday, May 19th, from 2 to 3 p.m. And we'll continue our discussion of mindfulness. And uh, Bridget will talk to us about mindfulness in regards to training and teacher development. So um, I'm really 
looking forward to that follow-up. Again, our captions were provided today by a la carte, and I do um, thank Bonnie so much for joining us today um, to um, type those up for us. She does a fantastic job every week. And if you have questions about the IGNIS series or um, need some additional information um, from me, please feel free to contact me as well. And I'm typing my um, email address in there since you can't snag it from the slide that you see right now. And all of these slides and um, John's slide deck, his extra resources, if you didn't get those downloaded when you logged in, those will um, all be posted on the ATO um, blog under under the um, menu tab for Ignis and I do thank you all so much for joining us and a big round of applause and thank you for jo to John for um, sharing his um, fantastic wisdom with us today I really um, really enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed our practice session earlier in the week so um, thank you to everyone Yes, and thank, thank you all in turn. It's been it's, I've really enjoyed this, and I really appreciate your participation and great great observations and questions at the end. And and I wish you all well in however you. Yeah, it was very eye opening for me personally, and um, yeah, I look forward to some further acceleration, and I can see where I can apply this in my own life. So I hope you all um, are walking away with um, something special today. So thanks again, and I'm going to turn our recording off now. Thanks.